This is a leader that uh, one can have uh, confidence in. She's confident in herself. She knows uh, what she wants to do. She uh, has the right uh, approach in uh, uh, getting people to understand that uh, uh, she's the leader and we need to be on our wing. And I just get that sense uh, every time that I hear her speak. The fact that she is um, a young premier, a you know, woman, um, quite accomplished. I believe she's a lawyer by trade. So I think, you know, for me, seeing her tonight and just listening to her tonight, you, you kind of get inspired from that and you think, hey, I can, I have the ability to do that as well. Now, I know that one of the things that, that uh, the organizers asked me to do was to speak a little bit about personal experiences, and I'm happy to do that. I'm not always quite sure if people are interested in that, but I, I did give it some thought today. You'll know that uh, my mom, uh, well, you may not know, my mother immigrated from Scotland in 1948 when she was eight years old uh, with her parents, and I think an awful lot about my mom. Uh, you know, in the 1970s, uh, well, first of all, she graduated from high school in Redwater. She went to secretarial college in Edmonton. She worked in Edmonton for ATCO, typing on five pieces of carbon paper with all the different colored paper in between, which my 10-year-old daughter can't understand. And she went on to get married, to have three daughters of her own, and to live a life at the beginning of being a very traditional housewife. Then through the 70s, you'll remember Maud and all of that, my mother decided to get a career. Now, she didn't have a formal education or training, so she decided to be a real estate agent. That was tough going, but she liked it. It was fun. It was a way for her to balance different, uh, different challenges in her life, to make sure that she was able to take care of us, to be a wife, and to have a career. And I am going to suspect there's an awful lot of people in the room who don't actually understand just how much of a challenge that was for a 35 or 36 year old woman in 1975 or 1976. And I'm pretty sure at that time that I didn't understand that. Because when I think about my family and I think about my mom and I think about my granny, I think about strong women that were committed to their community, committed to their church, committed to their family, and were always striving to do more. They were resilient, they were compassionate, they didn't always get it right, but their core values were about being strong role models for their daughters. Now she worked hard to try to be, and was for me, a very independent person and a role model for us. And she says she remembers being at home and her principal and her teacher coming to the house and asking, begging her parents to let her stay in school because they knew that she would be a wonderful teacher. And her parents said, no, we have mouths to feed. So at 14, Granny went and worked in a candy factory. And she walked a very long way to work every day. And she came home, worked there for 10 years, eventually got married <coughs> to my grandpa, and they immigrated to Canada, moved to Edmonton, and then to Redwater and were very active in the community and the church. Opened small businesses, renovated houses, and my memory of this woman, who was formidable, was to know that she could always overcome whatever happened. And if there was any challenge in the community, she was there to help solve it. Many times she'd identify the challenge in the community. She would be there to identify where the gaps were and to help people. You know, there's a wonderful story from the 1970s when the Canadian International Development Agency started, or whatever it was called in the 1970s. And a number of development officers were off in Africa trying to build water wells, sort of like Nathaniel, who we gave the Queen's Silver Jubilee Medal to today, an 11-year-old boy raising money for water wells in Tanzania. But way back then, development officers would go into communities in Africa, sit down with the chief, and they decide where to build the water well. And this actually became a real scandal because after about two years, they realized that the chief never got, went to get water. It was always the wives and the women and the daughters that went to get water. And so these are, to me, real life examples of how you actually need to identify the challenges that we face in our community and in political life based on the experience of people that actually understand how the decisions that government makes, that we make as industry leaders, 
actually impacts people's lives. Because it strikes me so often that if we are trying to find the people in a community that are truly yearning for fairness and for freedom and for equality, we must look to the women in our community. And from my perspective, those experiences really enhanced my commitment to engaging women in the political process, to ensuring, even here in this province, that women believe that they can have a voice and have an impact on the public policy decisions that we make. And whether I'm here or whether I've been overseas, I'm absolutely touched by the inspiration that community leaders who are women, who are living their lives and doing work with children on health projects, on water projects, can bring to a perspective in terms of the decisions that we need to make.